Let me invite you to find your way back to your seats and we'll get started. Why don't you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 126, Psalm 126. We want to understand the Psalms and uh, how to use them in our lives. It's important for us to understand what they are. When we come to a Psalm, what we come to, first of all, it's important for us to know, and and you probably already know this, that it's lyrics. If you read a Psalm, it's lyrics to a song. Right? But we also have to keep in mind that the book of Psalms is a collection of songs inspired by the Holy Spirit, given by God through his people, right? for them to sing together as the people of God as they worshiped him. So these are literally, when we come to the book of Psalms, the kinds of things God wants to hear from us when we worship him. This can be a great comfort because we see there's a whole full range of human emotions in the Psalms, which means that there is no human emotion which we experience that does not have an appropriate place in the worship of our God, even collectively as his people. Psalm 126 is a part of a collection within the book of Psalms called Songs of Ascent. Uh, Essentially what it was is as uh, certain times of the year would come and the people had to travel to Jerusalem, to the temple for religious festivals, uh, of course, they were all traveling by foot, right? And so they would stream in from the surrounding area, uphill, ascending towards Jerusalem. And as they traveled, they sang these songs together. Let's read Psalm 126. A Song of Ascents. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Let's pray. God, we pray this morning that through your word, through this psalm, you would remind us of the joy that you provide by your grace. Father, we pray that through our study of this psalm, you would show us um, a pattern for, for our lives, how we are to live in the world where you've placed us, with faithfulness to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, This psalm is a psalm that is obviously characterized by joy. God's grace produces joy in the life of his people. This is something that Christians have always believed. It's something that scripture testifies to, that the grace of God produces in the life of believers joy. It produces joy by means of transformation. It takes what was previously joyless and produces joy. It takes what was hopeless and brings hope. Two things we notice in this psalm at the beginning, we'll look at just briefly, about this joy. The first is that the joy produced in the life of a Christian is a work of God himself. If you look at verse 4, it says, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. The Negev was a desert region. It was a dry region. And here, in this psalm, issued as a prayer, it's asking God to restore their fortunes the way streams bring water to the desert. Now, if there's anything the ancient Israelites understood, it's something that we understand as well, and it's that only God can produce rain in the desert. There was nothing Israel could do during their time in the desert, traveling through it, or their time wandering in it, to produce the rain they needed for streams to flow. They merely had to ask God and to wait for him 
to work. The joy which God brings to our life, which transforms our joylessness the way streams transform the desert, comes as an act of his grace. It is his work. We cannot produce it, no matter how we might try. The next thing we see about this joy is that he produces it in us, at least in part, for his own glory. Look at verse 2. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. One of the results of the joy produced in the life of his people as an act of God's grace, of his work for them, is the surrounding nations looked at the way God had blessed them and said their God has done great things for them. And his name is praised. He is, he is known as a God who does great things for his people. This is incredibly good news because it means that when we're insecure and we think that God would have no good reason when looking at us to give us joy, right? Even though he's promised in his word, even though we know it comes as a gift of grace, not because of anything that we've done, we can rest in the fact that one of the reasons for giving us joy is so that others will look and see what he has done and praise his name. God's grace produces joy in the lives of his people. But even so, as Christians, we frequently miss this grace. We wonder... If God's grace produces joy in us, if he does it as a work of his own goodness, an expression of his own power, if he does it in part for his own glory, then why don't we see more of this joy in our lives? There are lots of reasons for that. We're going to look in this psalm and just see a few reasons why we may miss this joy in our lives. There are a few reasons why it may seem like he's not providing joy. The first is this. Joy is a result of the grace of God in the lives of believers, but grace does not mean that life will be easy. In fact, God's grace means, given to us, that there will be Weeping in our lives, there will be tears. Look at verses 4 through 6. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. This psalm seems to suggest that the normal course of the life of the believer is to experience from time to time days of weeping, of sorrow, Tears. Why does the grace of God given to us mean that Christians will necessarily cry in this life? There are a few reasons. Look, Christians believe the gospel. Christians are those whose, whose hope is in God, whose trust is in the things that God says. Our trust is in his grace. And because we believe his word because it shapes the way we see the world and the, we, the way that we see life and the way we see our own lives, we've seen what it is that life ought to be, what it is the world was created to be, what it is that we are meant to be, and what it is that all of those things fall short of being. And so it's impossible as a Christian to see what life is meant to be, what the world is meant to be, what our lives are meant to be, what our spirits are meant to be, to see how far we fall short. And in, and in the gap, it's impossible for us to not experience some measure of frustration and discomfort and sorrow in that. It's heartbreaking to look at the world and see war, to see abuse, to see oppression, to see racism, to see sexism, to see marriages fall apart, which were meant to be till death do we part. And in and, and all of this, It'll cause a heart which is awakened by the grace of God to feel the way God feels about these things. And God weeps 
over the brokenness of our world. So, in part, to experience the grace of God, given to us freely through Christ, will necessarily cause us to grieve the things that grieve the heart of God. The second reason that receiving grace from God will cause us to weep is because God's grace is redemptive. It's salvific, it saves, it redeems, it heals, it changes. I had a seminary professor who said this simple thing, and I don't know if it originates with him or somebody else wrote it, or it's just a proverbial truth that floats around. But redemption is change. Change is loss. Loss is pain. Pain makes us cry. There is no redemption. There is no healing. There is no restoration without discomfort, without weeping, literally or figuratively, right? Look, you guys know uh, my oldest son was struck by a car in November. His leg was shattered. His teeth were broken. Concussion, all of this, right? And watching him heal from this, it's been great, he's, he is healing well, he's doing well, but the process has not been easy. And in the days when, when he couldn't stand, it was frustrating, right? And they had him on pain meds, and the pain was at a certain level, but then when the time came for him to begin to move his leg, to stretch his leg, to stand on his leg, to learn to walk first with crutches, and then without, and then to navigate stairs up and down, you can imagine that as his leg healed... And as health began to be restored to his body, that was accompanied by pain. There is no healing, there is no restoration, there is no redemption without discomfort and without pain. And God's grace brings redemption. God's grace works restoration in us. God's grace brings healing to our souls. And therefore, it will necessarily create discomfort in us. So maybe one of the reasons that we miss the joy that God's grace is able to produce in our lives, which he promises it will produce in our lives, is because we allow the joy to be eclipsed by the pain, the discomfort, and the sorrow. We are under the impression sometimes that joy cannot coincide with weeping. But in fact, it does, and on this side of eternity for the believer, it will always coincide with some measure of sorrow and some measure of sadness, some measure of weeping. So Christians are called to cry. When we cry, we don't do it without hope. We don't do it without faith. We cry out to God knowing there's nothing we can do in the desert of our lives, of this world, to produce the rain that is needed. Only God can send the rain. We cry out in faith, trusting that he will do what he has promised to do, and that is in time, bring an end to our suffering, bring a fullness to the salvation he's given in Christ. And so we need to see that in the midst of our sorrow and our weeping and our frustration and our difficulty, that God is at work even in that. And that joy can accompany even our deepest sorrows. Life is hard. God prepares us for that reality. We remember that Psalm 126 is a psalm of ascent. And our lives are a journey upwards towards the mountain of God, from which our help comes. We can weep, but we can't quit. Secondly, we miss the joy sometimes that God longs to produce in our lives or which he is providing for us because we think that grace means that life will be easy. But in fact, what we see in this psalm is that there is, there is no promise that because God gives his grace freely at no cost to us, 
that therefore life will be easy. In fact, when God extends his grace to us to save us, to heal us, uh, to do his work of restoration and redemption in us, it brings along with it responsibilities which require effort on our part. Now, to some of us, this sounds wrong to our ears. We think grace is opposed to effort. No, grace is opposed to earning. Grace is opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's freely given, and it requires something of us at the same time. Look at verses 4 through 6. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing sheaves with him. This is agricultural language. Everything in the Psalms speaks to the grace of God that provides the salvation. He does the saving. He does the redeeming. He sends the rain. And yet, those who go out sowing seed because of his grace, return with the harvest. But they go out sowing seed, right? As a result of his grace freely given to them, they are called to engage in this endeavor. Listen, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy... He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Everything about this speaks of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has its origin in the work of God only. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. You cannot cause yourself to be born. Not the first time, not the second time, and it works the same way with the gospel. God has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Verse 5 says, By God's power we are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And yet, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Presbyterians hate this verse. Right? We hate this verse. Okay? Look, it makes us uncomfortable because it has become so ingrained in us to insist that salvation is first and last and only a work of God. Yes, that is true, but we ought not fear any verse of Scripture. It's all for our good. It's all God-breathed. And and what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, is work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For, verse 13, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He's saying God has worked in you to want the right things and to do the right things for God's pleasure. Now you work out in your life the implications of what God has worked in you by his grace alone. Grace is opposed to earning, it's not opposed to effort. And in the Christian life, we think no effort is required. It's all by grace. I don't have to do anything. No, it's all by grace. Therefore, there are things you are obligated to do, Christian, because of his grace. But but if we sit back and we say, oh, the way of the Christian life is to do nothing and to try nothing and to endeavor nothing and to make no effort, And then we wonder why joy doesn't come. We've not availed ourselves of the conduits by which joy comes into our lives from God. Yes, listen. Grace always precedes our effort. Always. Ten commandments, right? Ten commandments. Exodus chapter 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Have no other gods before me. Okay? Before God tells Israel what is required of them in their lives, he reminds them that he is the one who liberated them from slavery in Egypt. Salvation comes first. Deliverance comes first. Grace comes first. Now here is how you are obligated to live as a result of having been a recipient of my grace. Grace is opposed to earning 
But grace requires effort as a result. Not in order to receive it, but because we have received it. Listen. Redemption and forgiveness is a free gift of God's grace that comes to us only by by faith in Jesus. There's nothing we do. There's nothing we must perform in order to receive it. It's a free gift of grace. We merely receive it as a free gift. But it's a free gift like a family farm is a free gift if you were to inherit the family farm. right? Having done nothing to earn it, you didn't have to pay for it, there was no down payment required, you don't got to make the mortgage, only by virtue of having been born into that family, you inherit this great treasure, the family farm. But having received freely the family farm, guess what? you got to work it. you got to make an effort. you got to get up every morning at 4.30 and go milk the cows, right? you got to plow the back 40. You, effort is now... This is what it's like to be a Christian, to receive the grace of God. It is a great privilege, and it's ours only by virtue of having been born again into the family of God. There's nothing you can do to make yourself be born. You, it passively happens to you, Right? God could have chosen any imagery he wanted to for that salvation relationship, and he chose being reborn. Babies do nothing. They just show up when the time is right, right? And yet, by virtue of being born, you now have a family farm to work. One of the problems, okay, about 10 years ago, do you remember this thing? It was terrible. I didn't play it. It was the most annoying thing ever. Uh, You remember Farmville on Facebook? right? Like, like about a decade ago, I guess. Uh, it was this uh, online video game thing where people, um, I don't know, they like made little virtual digital farms, and they had to collect coins and then plow fields and plant crops and all this kind of stuff, right? And people had fun with it, and it was a way for them to interact with friends, I guess, or whatever online. Uh, but here's the thing. There are some subcultures within Christianity, right, which have given us the impression that farming is like playing Farmville. Okay? Farmville has a has as much in common with what real farming is like as some presentations of the Christian life have to do with what living a real, authentic Christian life is like. Right? Farmville, there's no dirt. You don't have to sweat. Your back doesn't hurt from, from, from shoveling or baling hay, Right? You don't blow your nose at the end of the day and the boogers are black from all the dirt in the head, right? There's no, in Farmville, there's no manure. On a real farm, there's sweat and there's toil and your muscles hurt and it smells like horse manure, right? One of the reasons we miss the joy of the Christian life is because we think we're living one when really we're just doing the Farmville version. But you should be encouraged, if that's been your experience, there's no reason to deconstruct your Christian faith. Maybe all you need to do is trade in Farmville for the real farm, okay? Real grace is not easy. Real love is not easy. Real relationship with people and with God and with the church especially is not easy, and many times it's not even pretty. But it's good, and it's redemptive, and it's healing. We assume that we can live the Christian life without the work of sowing seeds, and this is a mistake. We're always sowing some seed. We're always planting something in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts. We're allowing something to germinate within us. It's either going to be the gospel of Jesus Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit 
or it's going to be some false gospel. Weeping is a passive obedience to God where we yield our hearts to him and say, let me grieve the things that you grieve. Sowing is active where it propels us out into the world on mission to do the work that needs to be done, to give living expression to the goodness of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ which we've embraced and which we believe. But if we didn't know that that included sweat and toil and it smelled like horse manure, if we didn't know that, then when we experience that, we think something is wrong and where is the joy? Look, I know it's hard and I know some of you are tired of the struggle and you just want to lay down and surrender or walk away and disgust because of what you've experienced in the church and in life, because of what you've seen, because of what has happened to you. I know it's hard and God knows it's hard. The good news is that you can weep. Your heart can break over these things because God's heart breaks over these things. And God will comfort you and your brothers and sisters in Christ will comfort you, but you can't quit. Refuse to despair, even within your sadness. Hold on to the hope of the gospel. We will not coast our way into Christ-likeness. Grace Central, you will not coast your way to becoming a more vibrant and healthy version of yourselves. We will not coast our way to healthy families or healthy marriages. Redemption comes to us freely as a gift of God's grace, but then we are given the responsibility of working the land. Grace means crying is acceptable. It means effort is necessary. And it means that we may have to wait to see the joy and the relief that we long to see. We may have to wait for the joy to come in its fullness. Some of you are in a place right now where you're experiencing darkness and difficulty and joylessness. And, and, and you read the words of Scripture, you say, but God, where is the joy? I'm trying to trust you, I'm trying to believe you, but I'm not seeing it, I know. You may have to wait. Look, verse 1, Psalm 126, verse 1. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. What it's talking about here is Israel's return from exile, right? So in, in uh, 586... Israel was conquered by Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar, and he came in and he conquered Israel and he carried the people off into exile out of their own land, weren't even living in their own land, right? And carried them off into Babylon and gave them Babylonian names and Babylonian jobs, and, and they, were, they were expected to assimilate fully into Babylonian culture, but of course the people of God can never fully assimilate into any culture aside from the kingdom of God because our citizenship is not fully compatible with citizenship in the cultures of this world, but the effort was made by Babylon, and after a while, what happened? God allowed Babylon to be conquered by Persia, and King Cyrus comes in and conquers Babylon, and Cyrus is like, let's let some of these people, these exiles, return to their own land. So then in 538, the first wave of exiles returned to their own land. And that is the, is the restored fortune that verse 1 is talking about. But they had to wait. For 48 years, the people languished in exile, wanting the return. The return that God had even promised them throughout the Old Testament prophets. They had to wait before they could even experience the joy that Psalm 126 is remembering. We live in an instant culture. More so than ever before, we live in an instant culture. If, if uh... All right, so these days, you, we, all our cameras are digital. And you can also make phone calls with them. But our cameras are digital. And you take a picture, and you edit it instantly put your filter on or whatever, you post it online so that all your friends and all your family and the whole world can see it instantly. Like, like 10 seconds between taking the picture and, and your friend on the other side of the planet being able to see it. Instant. And it's become such a routine part of our lives, we don't even notice that it's not normal. Listen, in the old days, cameras used to be big and they had stuff called film. And you had, I'm serious, some of you don't know this, you had to take film and you had to put it in the camera and then you would take pictures and you couldn't see the pictures you were taking, right? You didn't know what they looked like. And then when the, all the film was, was done, it was full, 
you would take the film out. Now listen, this next part, if you're under 29, this is going to sound like I'm making it up, but I swear it's all true. Okay? You would take this film out, and you would go, for instance, to Kmart. You didn't go into Kmart. You went to the parking lot of Kmart. Because in the parking lot of Kmart, there was a little hut. I know it sounds made up. There was a little hut, a little tiny hut, about the size of a porta potty. And inside the hut, there was a guy working. He just sat in there all day, just sat in there. And you would drive up, and you would hand him through the window your film, right? And he would take it. And I don't know what he did with it, but two weeks later, you come back to the hut, and you give him some money, and he hands you an envelope. And in the envelope are 24 or 36 photos that you would take with a film. And not until then do you get to see what it is that you took pictures of. And half the time it was your finger in the way or cut off people's heads or whatever, right? And then the only way to post your photos was with a magnet on the fridge. And for your friends and family to see it, they had to come to your house and be in your kitchen. Right? That's the way it was for a long time. For most of history, we've had to wait on things. For God's people, most of life, listen, for God's people, most of life is experienced like the time between the taking of the photos and getting it back from the guy in the little shack in the parking lot of Kmart. It's trusting, it's believing, it's hoping. It's trusting that we're going to be shown something good and beautiful when the, when the, ti when the time finally comes. But between now and then, we, we live in the gap. Israel learned this truth the hard way as they languished for 48 years in exile waiting for God to do something good and beautiful in them and through them and for them so that the nations could see and say, their God has done something good for them. And during their time in exile, they kept living. They got about their business. They kept living. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4, this is God's word to the exiles in Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. God's, God's commandment, God's directions for how to be his people in exile. God says, just keep living, keep living. While you wait, keep living. Build houses, plant gardens, get married, have kids. And don't be bitter against the place into which I've sent you into exile. Contribute to its good and to its flourishing. As it flourishes, you will flourish. If you find yourself in a difficult spot right now where you are waiting for God to show you some joy, right? You're, you're, you're believing him, you're taking him at his word, but you're not seeing it. I, look, what you're experiencing is not strange or abnormal. Much of the Christian life is about waiting for God to do what he's promised to do. In the meantime, be about the business of living the life that God has given you to live, right? Tr trusting him in time to do what he has promised to do, right? Looking to him, right? He's the only one who can make it rain in your desert, right? So no use looking to any other gods. When rain comes, it will be from him. And in the meantime, know that it's your duty to weep and to work and to wait for the time when rejoicing will come.
and carry with you these verses as a promise. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Your joy will come and will be just as real as your weeping is now. And the nations will see and say, their God has done something great for them. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would give your people patience and long-suffering. Father, we pray that when you give us joy, you would give us the good sense to see it, to notice it, to embrace it, and to realize that it has come as a gift from you. Father, we pray that you would strengthen your people as we live in a kind of exile in our world today and in our own lives. Father, we pray that you would show us what it means to be about the business of living our lives as we wait for the fullness of our redemption. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's a confession of faith printed in your worship folder. It's from Heidelberg Catechism, question 26.